Welcome to the show today, uh, the Politics for the People show. And I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton. And uh, our topic today, which we're going to get right to, is the role of propaganda in genocide. Today's guests are here uh, and informed and eager to discuss this topic, and they are Jay Fidel. Welcome, Jay. And Tim Apicella. Welcome, Tim. Well, getting right into it, I uh, wanted to ask you, Jay, to define for us first, just to clarify, I'm sure most people know uh, in general, but would, would you clarify uh, what propaganda is and some of its sentiments? Well, false information intended to deceive um, people, intended to change public opinion in a way that you want. Um, it's lies. Uh, I mean, I think implicitly it's lies. Uh, it's disinformation, misinformation for an intended purpose and intended, and I'm, I'm sort of making this up, intended to reach a lot of people. I think that's another implication of it. Uh, reach a community, reach a, a population, reach the whole country. Mm -hmm. All right. The other question is uh, related to that is about the title, the topic. And and so, Tim, can you tell me about genocide? What What does that mean? Well, genocide is the intended slaughter of a race, creed, or a peoples. Um, no one is spared. It's the entire, it's the entire um, population within a country or countries that you're trying to extinguish. Uh, religion, race, um, color, creed. And um, it's obvious when you see it. And I think we are seeing it uh, unfold in the Russians' treatment of the Ukrainians as they advance and retreat from Ukraine. So that that's really helpful, Tim. And I'm, I'm gonna switch back to Jay and ask him about the legality of um, the two terms. First of all, propaganda. Is that an, an ordinary um, enactment of free speech or a conversation or, um, uh, and, and how does it, is it lawful propaganda? Well, if you have a First Amendment, the answer is yes, it's lawful. Um, you know, there are very few exceptions to the First Amendment in this country, although the exceptions these days uh, seem to be greater. Uh, in other countries, if you use propaganda, you know, it may be very lawful or it may not be lawful at all, depending on who you are and what message you're sending. Free speech isn't treated the same way. All right, so uh, there's a there's a little bit difference, but in in general, uh, depending on um, an ideology. Well, if I, if I say that Ukraine uh, and Russia is a war, um, you know, in Russia, I I go to jail for 15 years for saying that. Um, if I say it's um, it's just a military action, I don't go to jail. Mm -hmm. So you can see how free speech is uh, treated differently in Russia. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., there would be no, you know, no um, limit to saying either one of those things. That's a much different mm -hmm. concept. And of course, we even teach uh, propaganda and disinformation and all of its variations are, are actually in the curriculum of the U.S. schools, because we all remember going through those. And uh, well, I'm afraid I can't tell you what's in the curriculum of the U.S. schools anymore. I think that varies from state to state, just as the books do from state to state. So I, I, I have no level of confidence in what they teach in the U.S. schools these days. That's a good point, Jay. Thank you, because it used to be the textbook uh, uh, organizations, corporations that drove that, but those are approved by the state. And now that's not even uh, making a difference because as we've seen, parents have to be involved. But all right, well, well, Tim, let me ask you about genocide. Is that legal? No. Anywhere? Well, it's, it's illegal until someone can identify it and take the steps necessary to um, take it to the international courts and do something about it. But uh, no, genocide is not legal. Um, is war legal? Uh, yeah, unfortunately it is. <laughs> what, what a statement that is to say about the human species is as war is legal, um, but there's rules of war. Um, I reminded that the 
you know, you have the Geneva Convention, um, that kind of a, a, a marker about what's legal and what's not legal in war. Um, if I may, just for a second, get back to um, get back to the difference between propaganda and persuasion. Um, there was a time when the term rhetoric was a positive term, believe it or not. And rhetoric is using the techniques and properties of persuasion to unify a population for the betterment of society, betterment of people's lives. That was the term in, in use in ancient Greece. Um, and you know, back in the day where you used rhetoric uh, to unify and to enhance and improve uh, the society and people's lives. Now rhetoric is a dirty term. And the elevated and to yes, elevate. And elevate. Now, so yeah. there's a difference between persuasive techniques that you use in speech and you use at the podium and use to unify a population versus um, telltale signs of propaganda. And the two are vastly different, but you, but you can uh, mix and match and be very effective. And, um, you know, I have a list of things, but we can talk about those later. Okay. All right. Well, um, your list of things is welcome. I uh, think, okay, the point is made about um, the ideology um, of uh, the country influencing not the use of propaganda and who uses it. Um, and of course, the, the um, genocide is, uh, um, is a sin. I think in most uh, cultures. But anyway, um, Jay, talk to, can you talk to us about when, whether the U.S. Do you say like, genocide is a sin? I was saying that genocide, well, can be considered a sin. Well, some, some, there's some countries that believe in it as a matter of religion. And that religious belief. Not only, not only is it not a sin, it's, a, it's dictated by the religion. No, I, I don't know if it's a true statement. I mean, to answer that question, genocide includes murder. Um, it's murder on a large scale. Mm -hmm. um, I think most most societies treat murder as um, you know a, a cardinal mm -hmm. uh, sin and a capital crime. Yeah. Um, the, the 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 question is whether that changes if it's a call it a, a matter of state policy, a political murder, if you will, murder of a group, and if if the particular mm, state. Uh, is uh, asking you to do that, then certainly that state is not considering it murder. Um, if the state is not asking you to do that, then certainly the state would consider it murder. So I think, you know, it's, it's very confused when you have a world in which some states want to have genocide. If a, a soldier goes to war and the war is an illegal war in that state, um, that's that's murder. If if he's if the state is saying that uh, we don't want you to go to war, uh, we we want you to go to war. We want you to kill Ukrainians. Um, that's not murder. That's war. And as as Tim said, um, you know that's that's not illegal. And genocide, of course, is um, an extension of war. It's war against the people. It's killing people. And the question then is, uh, who is going to you know, we were talking about this the other day. Who is going to say that it's genocide rather than war? Mm -hmm. uh, and is genocide illegal? Well, I don't. I don't think you find it in the in the state statutes of Ohio that genocide is, is illegal. Um, you might find terrorism is illegal, or um, terroristic threatening is uh, illegal, or murder is illegal. But you wouldn't find a reference to genocide. In fact, I I doubt that most countries have. Uh, a, a, a statute that prohibits genocide. It's international law, the, the law of nations uh, that pro prohibit uh, genocide. But it's, you know, frankly, getting pretty sloppy these days. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was going to ask. When it's illegal, when it's not illegal, yeah. and, and, and whether an international law that might prohibit it mm -hmm. as war crimes and the like, uh, whether they're um, in place and enforceable. Uh, or whether a country like Russia can get away with it. So well, I was going to ask about the law of war, which um, which you're referring to, I think, uh, in, in international law, but they are two distinct areas, the, the law of war. And um, does uh, genocide uh, 
<laughs> and I don't know that much about the law of war. I don't know what any of us do, but um, do, do you understand or sense that the genocide is unlawful within the law of war? So is that perhaps a line, a red line or a tipping point, the issue uh, of the, 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 the uh, act of genocide or what can be seen as genocide? I, I, don't, I can't speak to international law you for know, two reasons. One is I, I, it's very hard to, to find it these days. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second, it's, it's, it's just not clear in any event, I guess. And also that, you know, it's not being enforced in the same way that it was before. Mm -hmm. So um, I, don't, I don't know if that question helps us um, deal with the title of this show, which is the well, role of propaganda in genocide and the yeah. vulnerabilities of the human condition that would allow people to be subject to and vulnerable to propaganda and to make them believe on the basis of propaganda that genocide is okay. And, and that I was trying to, to, to push around on those terms to see where there's overlap or if there was a clear distinction. And of course, you're bringing up the point that, that there's not, and there are many factors involved in that. And it's quite confusing. And here we are again in another circumstance where there's enormous propaganda going on and, and disinformation and also potentially or possibly uh, a genocide. So I uh, was just going to try and, you know, separate things out so we could take one over the other. But I don't I don't know. Well, that, yeah, let's, Tim, let's look at what Putin is doing to try to cover up not only genocide, but the initial war crimes, again, crimes against humanity. Um, so, you know, Putin has done the classic things that you often see in propaganda. What's that? Control the media. Uh, eliminate any criticism. So you control the media, stop the criticism, stop the newspaper, stop the radio. Um, he enacted specific crimes against the, the, the Russian population from saying war or invasion or 15 year terms of imprisonment potentially for saying these words. So you're number one, you're trying to control the message. That's, that's a clear sign of propaganda. Number two, you're trying to instill fear well, he's doing that with 15 year sentences. That would get my attention if I was a Russian citizen. Uh, number three is he's one of the, and we saw this with Donald Trump, uh, the big lie. You're putting the big lie out there. What's the big lie? I have to liberate Ukraine to free the Russian people from Nazis. That's the big lie. And then what do you do with the big lie? Well, as we saw in the Trump administration, you re repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Uh, <laughs> um, also, simplicity, slogans, the use of, 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 of a truncated sentence over and over again so that the human psyche can absorb it, remember it, and then ingest it. And then it becomes part of their vocabulary. Uh, other things that you have is um, the appeal to the individual's prejudice. Human beings as a, as, as a sort are, are prejudiced, they're prejudiced. And, and if you could tap into that prejudice and amplify it and repeat it and make them agree that they're not wrong in being prejudiced and it's no longer prejudice, it's the way things should be, um, that's propaganda. That's, that's beautifully done by Trump and by Putin. The prejudice of the Ukrainian, the re re Ukrainian government to abuse Russians. Uh, exaggeration. Where did we see that in the Trump administration? The use of exaggeration. Well, so is Putin. Putin yeah. is well, that, that's, exaggerating that's the, um, the effectiveness of the Russian people, the Russian military, and they're, they're, they're doing great things in, in Ukraine. Uh, he's not going to talk about the 15,000 potentially Russian soldiers that have now been killed in this invasion of his. So there's a whole litany, a whole list of things that Putin is using to basically get away with uh, crimes against humanity. And now in this case, genocide. Yeah. Well, you know, Jay, that, that's very, very helpful, um, Tim. And, and Jay, let's go over to the human frailty part of it and the social psychology. What, why are, what, what is it in the human that makes them vulnerable to this that, kind that of- That is the question. question of the day. Is the it's the question of the millennia. Um, you know, for example, arguably religion itself is propaganda. Religion makes makes mythology up, uh, and that and that people and that people buy into it on a large scale, uh, and it takes them out of rationality, and it motivates them to do things they wouldn't do, and it is not necessarily moral. 
at all. And so, um, you know, if you look through history, I'm sure there's a, there are experts about this, um, you will find that um, propaganda and all those techniques that Tim was talking about uh, work. They work. They work. They work over years and years and years. Um, they have worked for thousands of years in the human condition in one form or the other. So this is not new. The vulnerability is a social psycho psychological vulnerability. And it's sorry to say it's here to stay. And the only question is whether the people who understand it, like Putin and like Trump, whether they will continue to use it for malicious purposes. Um, I think I think that um, that Putin is is really clever in what he has done. I think Hitler was really clever. Um, you take a demagogue and you give him these tools, you give him this understanding of how he can lie to people and get away with it. You give him the you know the completely amoral um, mission of genocide. Um, and you tell them, use the tools to achieve genocide. It's doable. You know, they say never again. I guarantee it's going to happen again. It's part of, of the human condition. As much as the way ants make an anthill, uh, we are vulnerable to all of that. And even if we swear off it after a particularly horrible historical experience, it'll be back. It'll happen again. I, I, don't, I can't give you a good answer on how to prevent against it. Propaganda is like a verbal induction of hypnotic effect. And oh. I've been hypnotized uh, for entertainment back in college days. It was always fun to go to Belante and he would have an audience of 150 people. And, oh, you learn how to cluck like a chicken and all sorts of stuff you would do on stage. Uh, but I could, I could describe the effect of hypnosis. It feels like a, a severe compulsion and a loss of social inhibition. You take mm -hmm. those two and you kind of make a little patty cake out of it. And that's the, the effect of hypnosis. But here's the, here's the thing. Uh, you have to be willing to be hypnotized. Yeah. And like propaganda, you've got to be willing to say, well, that actually makes sense. And there's something about it. the human species that shouldn't be allowed to be hypnotized and do things that you would never even think about doing, but you do it. And that is the flaw of the human species, and there is no fix for that. But there is a fix to say, when I see these, these symptoms of propaganda, which I now call verbal hypnosis, when I see the symptoms of this propaganda, my red flag should go up and go, warning, someone is trying to hypnotize me um, while I'm awake. Well, that, that is uh, a good, good uh, bit of information on, on the, the experience uh, that you've had. Tim, but what about the per perpetrator? Let's talk about the perpetrator of this verbal, what are you calling that? Verbal hypnosis? I call it verbal induction of hypnosis. Verbal induction. So, all right, so we have people vulnerable due to human frailty to, to this kind of assault on their, their mind. Then all right, what about the people who assault them? So, so Jay, where, who, how does the person that uh, that does this to others who is a propagandist who is sending out disinformation what how did they figure this out where did they learn this what 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 can you say and, and in respect to the people we know that who do it now too not well i i think putin is a clever guy i think stalin was a clever guy if you have ultimate power and you see the way people react to your instructions um, you learn, you learn on the job, but maybe you also, you know, read some books like Mein Kampf uh, and, and, and you see how people do it and it and, and repeats itself. It repeats itself with all these, you know, uh, autocrats and, and, and tyrants. Um, I'm sure there are experts on how this, how this works and how you learn it and how you do it. Now, I'd like to, you know, say that in Russia, they got a long history of doing this. Um, they know how to how to do mind games. They know how to change you in prison. Um, they know how to m make you buy into something using fear. And Applebaum wrote about it in the Atlantic and Washington Washington Post. Um, they know how to change your mind. It's done with fear. It's, sometimes it's done with torture. You know, there's this whole thing about torture never really works. Well, yes, it does. Torture can change your mind. 
<laughs> if I put you in the bowels of Lubyanka prison and I try to um, change your mind, I will be able to do that. One of the most interesting books in, uh, was Darkness at Noon by Arthur Kessler. Uh -huh. where he talked about the techniques in Lubyanka prison. Yeah. And one of the things, and this maybe goes to what Tim was getting at, one of the things that the Russians did in, in the dark days of Lubyanka prison in the Cold War. Do we need a warning you, here? I'm sorry? Do we need to warn the viewers of an upcoming atrocity? No. Okay. Well, one of the things that they would do is they would ask you over and over again for your name. They would ask you to identify and define yourself. And the implication was not that they wanted to know your name. They knew your name. They wanted you to question whether that was really your name. They wanted you to question whether that was really you. They wanted to depersonalize you. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, part, if we had a psychologist here, it would be an interesting question to pose to that psychologist. That is, if I depersonalize you, Maybe I'm going down this, this path of induction uh, that Tim is talking about. It's, it's, I think there's a whole well, and, bunch of things well, in the human psychology that make us vulnerable um, okay. to what was happening in Lubyanka prison and can change our minds. Okay. Right, but now Personalizing how, someone is but, how you uh, commit yeah. atrocities and genocide. You're not right. killing but, human yeah. beings, you're killing an entity. Okay, but my question is, how is it that the learning occurs to do this. For, for example, I mean, mo there's modeling. Okay, so we have Hitler and Stalin for Putin. Well, this goes now, I don't back know to ancient Greece. Trump was, was just, was tr that Trump was- a It's out there, Stephanie. If you want to learn it, you can learn it. You can read books. You can try it out. You know, it's trial and error. Uh, if I give you a population, I put you in charge. I said, let's, let's see what you can do with them, Stephanie. Let's see if you can change their mind to really like you or dislike <laughs> someone else or- uh, get into a war, even though it's not, you know, not a good idea, uh, or to do some genocide or war crimes, even though it's not a good idea. You could well, test did... it out, trial and error, and Stephanie Stoltalton, as nice a person as she is, could learn it. Tim could learn it. I can learn it. I yeah, choose have. not to learn it. Tim chooses not to learn it, and you choose not to learn it, but any of us can learn it, and any of us can do it. I choose right, not to practice it. I've uh, learned Tim, it. I know... Tim, I, that is the case, and we we have a, we're all familiar with the novels and the and the documentaries, and we know that this happens. So what we're documentaries? About so I'm sorry. Is how, sorry how time they, out, you guys. Time out. I'm sorry. It's not documentaries. It's what we just lived through the last five years of this administration, the exactly. Trump administration. We saw countless and countless examples of techniques of propaganda. I don't exactly. need a documentary. I lived it. I watched it for five four years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Will, you, will right. you agree with me that um, that you have to be pathological to spend the time to learn it, to exercise it? Well, and, and the really good, the really good ones are pathological. Well, they're narcissists. I, they're... Okay, oh, Tim. What I want to ask about is Trump and how he learned this. Not being a history student well, or anything like that. First so wife, Marla. Minute, okay, just a go minute. Ahead. That's true. That one of the girlfriends said he always, or his former wife said that he had the Mein Kampf on his on his night table. Now, but but T Trump is not a reader. So what is it that he did to attain such an expertise in it? In other words, he did spend time in Russia. What was he doing over no, there? The baby. I, I, you know, Trump. Trump has been doing techniques of propaganda all his life since he was a child. Listen to his, um, his niece. Uh, she did well in interviews to describe Trump growing up and all the techniques that he would do to manipulate people were other forms of propaganda. So he didn't go to the school of Russia. He didn't, didn't read Mein Kampf to, um, to learn the dark art of propaganda. What he did was been practicing and then he honed his own experiences into a finer, finer dark art. So what you're saying is this is a man born with it. And so we might suspect that this is the case with a Stalin. And, and as I've mentioned before, you know, there's Roman emperors and people come out with these streets. Well, there's propagandists and there's, there's propagandists who are really, really good at it. And I would argue that, that Putin and, and Trump are really great, great propagandists. Well, if you right, so have a pathological person. Yes. They both do. Madison Avenue is, is loaded with good propaganda. Yeah, you can take a very they, innocent they and get them. To you. 
Yes. So you can sell soap or you can sell murder. That's um, right. to, to sell murder, you have to be a bit of a pathological person. All right, now here's another uh, important question. And let's go over to, um, let's, Jay, how about this? How do you stop it? Well, you know, um, how do you stop a pathological person is more like the question. Uh, and I, they're I a leader. I'm not, I'm not sure that we want to talk about how you stop Madison Avenue selling soap. No. Uh, we, want to, we want to stop a pathological person who has these skills to convince people of things that are not true mm -hmm. um, and, and, and use those skills to conduct genocide. Um, or the Holocaust, exactly. Exactly. or what, whatever you call what Stalin did, or what uh, Mao did in China. You know, 60 million people died in China because of mm -hmm. Mao, uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. I mean, you know, history is populated Just loaded with from it. way yes. back when with with um, yes. the propaganda that turned into genocide. Mm -hmm. How do you stop it? Is is mm -hmm. a very hard question, especially with nuclear weapons, um, which mm -hmm. which make you know which make the stakes so high. Uh, and it's really a question of how you stop a pathological person. And, and I think the answer is, um, you know, in, in the practice of law, <laughs> you'll deal with them in writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, can I have a crack at that one, Stephanie? The same question. You might have a crack at it. Well, you're right. You're next after Jay. Jay, Jay was. That's a very good point Jay just made about right. Well, the it's you know, yeah. it's child psychology. Yeah. It's primitive psychology. Yeah. How do you deal with a kid who is, um, you know, a problem kid yeah. who would like to burn the house down? Who might do do mm -hmm. exactly that? Yeah. Burn the house down. You have to put limits on him. You have to say, you know, Obama's red line didn't work, but you have to say, can't do that. And if you do that, there are sanctions on you. And I don't mean the kind of sanctions that the U.S. has been doing on Putin. I mean, well, other but your sanctions. point was also made if, if you did that, that these people are this way from childhood so that there might be some ways to be able to see it uh, popping up in childhood. But let's go on to Tim as the month, the time is going. Yeah, to you know, your... Stephanie, you actually alluded to it. You said you made an assumption and Jay uh, kind of refuted that assumption. And that was, oh, we learn about propaganda in school. Um, so you, your question is, how do we stop it? How do we stop propaganda? And it's education to recognize it when it occurs, as it occurs. And in the case of the Trump administration, I think the media tried to, although late, tried to identify techniques of propaganda and what he was doing and how he was doing it. But that's not enough because then part of propaganda was Trump was saying that's fake news every time that you know, the news is saying calling him out on propaganda he just say i'll just discredit the news and i'll call it fake news and that worked so the real answer is each citizen has to understand and know when propaganda is being um conducted and recognize it and say i'm not falling for that so it's education um sorry but stay up on current events so that when a propaganda starts to lie to you you go i don't think that's true and then, of course, to stop a propagandist when they cross the line is enforce the rule of law you have on the books. And if you don't have them on the books, make some laws to stop a propagandist in his tracks. Very good. So you're making the law up just like the propagandist makes up more Just like propaganda. we're trying to do about um, the Electoral College. We're yeah. trying to amend that now. So a propagandist, uh, a would-be autocrat, can't use game the system and convince the nation that he's not gaming the system. Okay, one more comment each. So uh, we're out, out of time. So Jay, can you give us a brief comment to sum this up as to propaganda and to the um, what well is about the uh, genocide too. Okay. I don't think we've even scratched the surface on this. And not a, not a chance. Um, this is a very, a very important subject and maybe we should schedule it again. Mm -hmm. um, because because this has not been a deep dive into either the causes or effects or the solutions to the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tim, um, what kind and of? I, I, I'll just conclude by saying right now the world, not just not just the Russians, because the Russians are 
the, the subject of propaganda and the lack of information and, and free press. But the world needs to recognize the propaganda and say no, definitively no, and start taking active measures to stop um, what, what Putin is trying to do is whitewash a genocide. And, you know, if that means um, more harsh uh, military actions and support from NATO and, and the United States, so be it. This monster needs to be stopped and stopped now. Final comment. Very good, Tim. All right. We are out of time at this point. And uh, I'm, I'm your host for this show, The Politics for the People. I'm Stephanie Snell Dalton. And I thank Jay Fidel and Tim Apicella for discussing a very complicated uh, set of issues that um, we barely scratched the surface on, but we are living very deeply within. So thank you. Mahalo and aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.